Um, good morning to everyone. A very uh, warm welcome to every participant. Thank you so much for taking your time to join the Dar es Salaam city specific training. Um, my name is Jacqueline Senyagua. I'm a researcher with the UMI in the Solution Plus project. I'm based in Dar es Salaam. And uh, together with me are my colleagues, Oliver and um, Edmund. I would like to take this opportunity to work through um, uh, the mother organization, which is UMI, and our partners, Fear, DART, Rupreach, Consult, UN Habitat, and ITDP. So I would really like to appreciate uh, all the effort that uh, our partners have put together. And uh, with, uh, without further delays, I would like to welcome my colleague, Oliver, for a brief introduction on the project, on the Solution Plus project. And after that, I'll take you through the uh, today's program. So with that, Oliver, welcome, please. Thank you, Jacqueline, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, nice to see you all. Just a very brief overall intro to Solutions Plus to those of you who have not been involved as closely as others. Um, Solutions Plus is uh, supported by the European Union. It's uh, called an, an INCO flagship uh, program that brings together 48 partners now, actually, um, where we work in uh, 11 living labs, one of which is Dar es Salaam. And we focus on the development of uh, innovative e-mobility solutions supporting the development of uh, different types of vehicles, focusing on uh, shared and public transport, as well as uh, last mile logistics, um, in particular with a focus on uh, two and three wheelers, minibuses, buses, vans, taxis, shared fleets. And then focusing on the operations of uh, e-mobility solutions with particular focus on charging, mobility as a service applications, and sorry, my slides disappeared for a second, sorry, um, and uh, the integration into local and national policy. Um, uh, that all is integrated in a five-pillared approach uh, where we inform partners and stakeholders on the different types of e-mobility solutions that are out there, uh, facilitate um, exchange uh, among officials, entrepreneurs, startups, companies, uh, and initiate partnerships. Um, and then one of the key elements of the whole um, uh, project is the implementation of demonstration projects which all together will um, bring us learnings from the applicability of different e-mobility solutions that we test in very different operating environments. Um, and that will help us to create the impact that we need for transformative change in our cities, as well as for global climate change mitigation. Um, all of this uh, is being uh, fed back into uh, the toolbox um, that uh, shares information on the technologies, policies, uh, implementation plans, financing solutions that we're having, and feeds into the capacity building and peer-to-peer -peer exchange program. Um, the key element of our work is the startup incubator that has been launched and where we support local startups uh, on specific technology uh, developments and uh, further development of their business. And uh, that's part of a wider global e-mobility platform that we run together with our friends at UN Environment at the International Energy Agency with a sister project supported by the Global Environment Facility. Uh, my slides are run, running faster than I am, but at least that gives a little overview of the overall program. But now we are doing the deeper dive into the city-specific training. So back to Jacqueline and uh, hope we're having a good and productive session today. Thank you so much, Oliver, for that uh, brief introduction that brings everyone into perspective, especially for um, 
uh, the stakeholders that are just joining us today for this particular training. Um, and with that, I will just uh, take us through the program for today. Um, our program today is going to have um, colleagues from uh, that. We are going to also have uh, local stakeholders presenting on, on the policy perspective in, in Tanzania and then, of course, ITDP and that. But uh, our next presenter is going to be Geoffrey Silanda from Latra, and he's going to tell us about the transport uh, policy overview in Dar es Salaam. Um, and then after Latra, uh, Mohamed Uganda from DAT is going to uh, pre present to us about promoting sustainable transport in, in Dar es Salaam. And, and uh, Prince Jali will come in after Mohamed. Uh, to give us a case study on electric um, 15 minutes during the discussion after the three presenters. Thereafter, we are going to have uh, Katie from Rupert Consult presenting to us, taking us through a policy planning and integration of immobility e uh, into sustainable, sustainable urban mobility plans. And from that presentation, we are going to have Penina from ITDP giving us a case study from Kisumu. Um, and finally, we're going to have the last Q&A uh, section, which is also another 15 minutes. And at the very end of our program today, we are going to have that and Rupert Consult giving us their reflections and closing remarks on, on uh, today's program. Um, that is how our program looks today. And I will stop sharing. With that, I would like to say Karibu Sana. That's a Swahili word for <laughs> very welcome. And I would like to give the floor to Lania. Latra, the floor is yours. Karibu. My name is Dr. Silanda. Uh, I am manager of road safety and environment working here with and the Transport Regulatory Authority, LATRA. My, my presentation will be on an overview of transport policy and environment in, in, in Tanzania. Critical areas will be policy priorities, stakeholders, and their ongoing actions. Uh, here in Tanzania, in transportation, we have two main, I mean, many policies. The first one is national road safety policy. This was from 2009, which is emphasizing a critical initiative to, 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 to elevate road safety issues to a position of high priority national agenda. This policy provided the basis for working, attaining the vision of safe traffic environment. The, this, this policy, I mean the national road safety policy, it also assists in guiding and coordinating rules and actions with the relevant ministries, agencies, and the private sector institutions towards the rational use of scarce resources we have, thereby avoid a duplication effort. And we have also have a national transport policy, 2003. And uh, this policy is aimed at, at developing safe, reliable, efficient, and fully integrated infrastructure and operations, which will best serve the needs of travel and transport at improving level of service at a lower cost manner, which supports government strategies for socioeconomic development, which being economically and uh, environmentally suitable. For the purpose of this uh, presentation, uh, I have taken a national road transport policy, few, few issues be, be because of uh, time. And uh, in a nutshell, let, let us see the transport network here in Tanzania. We have road network, which takes about 86, 472 kilometers. And uh, we have uh, two main railway. We have 
TRC, Tanzania Railway Corporation, which covers 2,706 kilometers. One being Tazara Authority starts, starts from Dar es Salaam to Tunduma and to, to, from Tunduma to Zambia at the city of Kapirimposhi. Tanzania country has a uh, hinterlands like Zambia, DRC, Burundi, Rwanda, Malawi, and Kenya. And we, we do have also ports. We have Port of Dar es Salaam and Tanga and Mtwala in, in Indian Oceans, and others we can we have in, in, in Mwanza and, and Kigoma for Lake Victoria, as well as uh, Lake Tanganyika. This country has more than 200 airports or airstrips. We do have also transportation for pipeline, which carries crude oil from the Leslam port to Ndola in, in, in Zambia. And currently we have a new project, Tanzania Uganda project, which will, will be transporting uh, again crude oil from Hoima to, to Tanga. This is a pictorial presentation of, uh, of, of transport network here in Tanzania and particularly the roads. Uh, in, in a nutshell, we have trunk loads, which covers 12,786 kilometers. This is managed by, by, by 10 loads. We have regional loads, which covers uh, 21,105 kilometers, which also is managed by, by uh, 10 loads. We have district roads, which covers uh, 52,581. This is managed by, by, by Talula and the, the, the entire network uh, is about 86,472 kilometers. And let me talk about uh, land transport the regulatory authority, LATRA, because we are implementers of the, of the, of the policy. In a nutshell, this LATRA Act number three of 2019 is here to, 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 to regulate road, railway, and the, and the cable. We do issue licenses for, 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 for commuter buses, for intercity buses, for this uh, traditional taxis, and uh, we, are, we, we hope we'll start licensing ride hailing motorcycles as well as tri tricycles. And for, 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 for motorcycles and tricycles, we have a memorandum of understanding with the local government. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are issuing licenses on behalf of LATRA. We do have also, we do have, we do have, we are licensing i mean good scaling services like it trucks and and, 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 and the train our main function is to 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 issue license renew sometimes if an operator is not in a position to follow lady down uh, license conditions then we we, we 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 normally cancel we also we are, we, are, we are responsible in establishing standards for regulatory goods and services. We also establish standards for terms and the condition of, of supply of regulated services. That's the, the, the other was I have said. We also regulate rates and the charges, fares from one place to another. We, we, we also regulate for, 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 for intercity buses as, as well as for, for intracity buses. Other function, we are, we, are, we are responsible in coordinating land transport safety activities. We are also responsible in registering crew and certifying drivers of liberated sectors. Other, other, other function is to certify road witness of road rolling stock and the road witness of public service vehicles and goods. And we are responsible to monitor performance of regulated uh, sectors including level of investment availability of safe quality and the standard of services 
cost of services, like I've said, that we we we, we also responsible in managing I mean, tariffs like fares. And for the purpose of this presentation, I have picked some of the uh, few policy direction, national roads, safety, and see how LATRA is implementing because we are implementers of such directions. Direction number one, the, 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 the policy directs drivers and the vehicle examination <clears throat> to, be, to be made in a collaboration with the Road Safety Board shall, 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 shall organize driver education and testing, which leads to certification of drivers to principles of, of, of road safety. In this mandate, in, the, in doing this mandate, LATRA has started registering drivers, and uh, it, this the, the process has already started started in March, and currently we have already registered 804 drivers, and we expect to start certifying them their competence to ensure that when they 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 they, they get our certificate they will be in a position to adhere to all the traffic rules and the, and, the, and the regulations. <clears throat> another, another policy election, the government shall encourage to compare safety culture to, to make in place, which ensure that weight legislation and immediately be followed and the vehicle is legally not to, to, to avoid overloading. The, the authority has been conducting safe, safe, I mean, conducting safety training for, 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 for transport providers in, in a, on a quarterly basis. Another policy direction uh, is the government should they should, should they put in place framework to regulate control importation of used second hand vehicles in Tanzania uh, latra has been working in a collaboration with the, with, with, with the other stakeholders uh, for example in july 2019 latra was among workshop uh, to support cleaner and and, and the more more fuel efficient policies in Tanzania among other resolution was, uh, was, was, was advised that the government to, 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 to concentrate to control the, 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 the importation of, of used vehicles. And the DC training was, was sponsored by, by, by UNEP. And as you can see, this year we are the, the, the participants for, for, for that workshop. And another policy that, Direction is uh, direct to have random roadside inspection in a collaboration with the other Ministry of Infrastructure and the Surface and Maritime Transport Regulatory Authority. This Surface and Maritime Regulatory Authority was before the, the uh, latter started. Uh, after Surface and the Marine Transport Regulatory separated into TASAC and, 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 and the LATRA. LATRA was given this uh, assignment. And uh, the, 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 the way of impl implementation, LATRA has been conducting roadside inspection in, collaborate, in a collaboration with the, with the, with the task, traffic policy uh, division, monitoring the, 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 the compliance with the condition of, 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 of licenses. As you can see there, we are we are we are we are we are monitoring if these operators are adhering the licensing condition. And another direction, I, I mean, direction was the government to to ensure that the specification for buses, including appropriate bodies, 
drawn by ministry responsible for road safety would be published. Latra is a member in an automotive, uh, automotive technical components committee uh, for Tanzania Bureau of, of Standards. Being a member, it has been participating in the process of the, the developing of the standard and there was a full, particularly for, for bus building uh, standard. Latra was full participated in developing the, the such a standard. We, we, we have many, many, many standards like, like, like standard for used vehicles, standard for emission. So that has been largely. Uh, we have another, an, another direction that the government should develop communication and education and public awareness programs that we disseminate this policy and the, the road safety strategy to understood. The authority has, has, has been doing this, uh, I mean, this assignment. And, uh, and uh, as you can see, the government, uh, there is another direction where that the government shall cooperate with the private institution on development research in Tanzania. And uh, you can see LATA itself has been, has been doing uh, research on improving, improving uh, road safety. And, uh, as you can see, it has been doing in collaboration with Disney. It has been in a collaboration with a, a Biko. You have many, many. Generally, other issues which are currently, uh, since 2017, uh, Latra has been into, has introduced the, the, the vehicle, the, the vehicle track, tracking system. And this is 24 hours. And uh, and uh, and uh, it gives the the it monitors to give the real time speed of the buses, and uh, when the driver turns sharp corners, then uh, sharp braking, then we always monitor the the the, the behavior of of, of 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 drivers. And otherwise, uh, the authority has been. Uh, uh, taking part in, in the collaboration with, with the other stakeholders and uh, to make uh, accident investigations. And uh, as you can see in my presentation, we, we did uh, in, 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 in 2017, there was a, a recent school bus, which accident occurred on, on 6 May 2017, and here in, in Kalatu. This accident caused death of uh, 35 it is and, and the city has injured. And, and, and the last week I was to, to I traveled all the way to, to Dodoma to do a, another an, another investigation whereby one passenger vehicle was, was, was overturned in, in, in Condor and we have already prepared the report so as to avoid the, the, the future occurrence of such incidences. And we have already so much have developed the curriculum for training of motorcycle riders and, and the like. And LATRA has, has, has also launched an online licensing system whereby our customers can apply license online rather than coming uh, here in, 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 in person. And we have, as I said, we have already started the uh, registration of, of, of transporters, right the hailing and, and the right sharing. Uh, maybe this here is our point of concentration. This is our, 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 our licenses we have been issuing from 2016 to 2021, because we are regulating by using licenses. And uh, for bus operators and the like, they have to follow the licensing condition. Before we provide them the li license, we have to make sure that all safety issues, they are comp complied. And for our side, I think for, for our topic today, you, 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 you might concentrate with, 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 with the licensed issued for motorcycles. From year 2016 to 2017, we, 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 we used, we, we, we issued 8,317 license and the 
in 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 2020 21 we we have we have uh, we have issued i mean 18 southern and i mean license you can see the way the 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 we are we are we are, we are, we are growing and uh, we are in in 26 uh, regions or 26 regions and we have as i said we have a memorandum of understanding with the local local government they are all issuing license and we have started the issuing license online the the the, the system which i have already said we have challenges we, we have the, the problem of, of, of so the accident challenges, lack of, of transporting and knowledge among operators. We have a challenge for, for our, our new vehicle tracking system. We have a problem of, 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 of tempering, but we are we are we are we are we are, we are trying to, 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 to alleviate this problem. And uh, as you can see, the, the vehicle inspection here is, is not automated, uh, automated. And we, the vehicles are inspected, inspected visually. And we are going to, to, to start. Uh, we have started the um, initiative to look at the possibility of, of, of inspection to, to be uh, automated. And we have lack of appropriate training and, and the examination of drivers, lack of, 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 of maintenance, issues of maintenance, and, and the most of HD we are importing. They are, they, they, they are aged vehicles, and that's what you can see. The, the, my, my, my last point is that they have excessive exhaust emission, which is not uh, adhering our, our, our air quality standards from, 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 from vehicles. Otherwise, I have to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey Silanda, for that uh, presentation. I think it has take, given us a, a broader overview of the policy landscape uh, in the transport sector in Tanzania. And of course, it has highlighted some of the areas for further development and uh, opportunities to always improve things. Thank you so much for that. I've seen some good questions coming your way, Geoffrey. And so, yeah. Uh, I think uh, they will enlighten us more on how Tanzania is positioned um, towards electric mobility and other cleaner energies. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like um, to encourage participants to continue asking questions. We'll keep them and ask them at a Q&A session um, after some few presentations to come. And um, for now, I would like to welcome engineer Kuganda uh, for his presentation from that on um, sustainable transport uh, in Dar es Salaam. Karibu sana, engineer Kuganda. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, this is the presentation from that agency. We are presenting the DAT system, its implementation, success, and challenges. And the presentation outline, sorry, I have to go very quickly. I, I think you can understand because there are a number of slides and uh, I limit myself to 15 minutes. So I got very quickly. So that is the intro, the presentation outline. We, we speak about the background, the BRT system, success and challenges, next step for implementation and conclusion. And on the background, we talk about uh, Dar es Salaam city. Uh, this is the major commercial city uh, uh, in Tanzania and this is one of the fastest growing cities uh, in the world. And the annual growth rate is about 7.7%. Uh, and the economic growth of the city of Dar es Salaam is estimated at 10% per annum. It is actually above the, the country average. And the annual uh, vehicular growth uh, is about 19%. Uh, uh, this is the data taken from 2002 up to 2015. So that is the status. So growing of vehicles bring about the challenges uh, along with. So uh, we have these challenges on the mobility in Dar es Salaam. As you can see, as you can see from the slides, model shares. Uh, the big share on the mobility is taken by public transport and non-motorized together form about 90% of the mobility in the city of Dar es Salaam. 
Uh, actually, uh, we used to have small daladars operating uh, in the Dalsam roads, and they were contributing a huge congestion, as you can see from the pictures. And these daladars were owned by private, and some uh, few were owned by the government, the uh, government and there, these dollars bring about uh, challenges uh, along with uh, because of uh, poor roads. We and the old dollars, we experienced an air quality degradation and health issues. And then they, these dollars were low capacity dollars, and they were operated in without schedule. So. Through those challenges, we decided to take on the other options to improve public urban public transportation in the city. We go through uh, different options for mass transportation in the Salam city. So we looked about the implementation of bus rapid transit. We thought about the underground metro, light rail, and the urban rail. These are the options for the improvement of urban public transport. And after the evaluation of the choices, we uh, opted to go for bus rapid transit. As you can see, the, the, uh, the development of bus rapid transit costs less than what if you compare to underground rail or light right rail. So we opted to go for the BRT, or city of Dar es Salaam, and in other cities in Arusha, they, in, in, in Africa, they actually opted the same as what we opted for the, uh, to implement the BRT. So if you can see the map uh, of Africa, different countries opted to go for the BRT, different cities and countries, and uh, Dar es Salaam, uh, we are far away, and for those, if you see the blue dots, those are the BRT which are already uh, on operation. And the others are just planning now. Nairobi, I know that they are just constructing, not yet in operation. So the aim is to do away with the uh, old uh, system of the uh, uh, operations. As you can see, this one is the picture of the operations uh, before. It is uh, uh, actually it was like chaotic and small capacity buses. Then after that, this is the change which we went from the old to the new system. As you can see, the old one is uh, it's not convincing, not comfortable, but the new one is comfortable and convincing and is high capacity. You see? So look about the stations. All the stations, we had this kind of uh, bus stops used by Daradaras. Actually, it is occupied by businesses and people know where to walk and bus stop is there. So this is the kind of station before and this is the kind of station with BRT. I just want to show you the difference between the old system and why we shifted it to BRT system. Uh, this is the difference of the uh, station. So if, if you, you, can, you can see this is that station which is comfortable and very spacious inside. And this is one of the old stations at uh, Waterfront. And this is new uh, Waterfront station. As you can see, <clears throat> it is much more improved uh, system. So what are the elements for the BRT when we consider going for BRT? Essential element for BRT, for those who are now developing uh, BRT infrastructure, we are far away. Uh, this is the one of the characteristics of the BRT system that uh, uh, the roads for the BRT should be se separated, physically separated from mixed traffic. So bus uh, lanes should be physically separated and located in the middle of the, the corridor. Uh, the stations are located in the middle. Those are the characteristics for the BRT. And uh, boarding and alerting is meant to be level. That is a level platform between bus and the station. This means to quicken people flow in and out from the bus. 
And this is the technology we use to pay for uh, fair. That is, uh, fair collection is, uh, is taken off board. There is no conductor inside the, uh, uh, the bus, like the Ladares. And the intersections, just to make uh, BRT move smoothly. So uh, this, this, some of the intersections were meant to be two phase signalized intersections with the restriction of right turning. And then the ITS system of the buses, these buses, uh, I, the BRT uh, system has to be monitored with the ITS system. So our buses are controlled from the control center managing the, the movement of the buses, the punctuality, and uh, uh, communicating with the drivers. Uh, other BRT features is the technology for the buses. We opt for the higher technology of the uh, buses in order to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission. So to start with, uh, our BRT started with Euro 3, but now we are thinking of going ahead to improvement uh, or using CNG or Euro and electric. Sometimes we, we, we are thinking of going to electric buses. And the system of the BRT is working in integration. Uh, this means uh, we integrate feeder and trunk system so that uh, we take passengers from the residence to connect with the trunk system to go to work or other places. Uh, and then they go back. So they, they use the integration of trunk and feeder services uh, uh, for the BRT. team. This is much more important because uh, now we have started the trunk feeder and in this feeder system, we are uh, thinking of actually we are, this is the, when we talk about solution plus we are talking about electric bajajis Then these electric bajajis will take part of the feeder system for uh, bringing passengers to the trunk system just like other feeder systems. For, yeah, for the better public transport system, uh, BRT uh, network need to be interlinked uh, uh, from all other phases. So we, we constructed the phase one, but we are going to, to, to construct phase two. Actually, it is undergoing, uh, and all other up to phase six. But the idea is you have to network, you have to integrate uh, all the BRT phases. The, the thinking is we have to increase uh, capacity, to increase speed and reliability, and the other parameters in BRT like safety, security, and emission. So you, you will do that by uh, uh, networking all the BRT phases. And this is the integration with the other modes of transportation that uh, when we, you introduce BRT, make sure that it is uh, interconnected with the other modes of transportation. For example, in this, in BRT phase one, we managed to connect with the ferry uh, at Kivukoni, and then we connect here with the other phases at Gerizani. Actually, phase one connects with the phase two and phase three at Gerizani. So a passenger can, if once, once entering the system of BRT, can uh, be able to travel anywhere within the system. That is the interlinking. And for phase three, it is going to connect with the airport and international airport of Julius Nyerere. So that is the networking and integration to other modes. So in at the end of BRT, there is connectivity with the feeders, connectivity with the uh, Uber like, uh, or Boda Boda or Bajajis to connect with terminals and other busiest uh, stations. Okay, so BRT is implemented in six phases. And all the six phases uh, are mentioned here, the numbers of kilometer, but we expect to have a total uh, of 148.5 kilometers uh, of uh, BRT networks. So the, so the whole of Dar es Salaam roads will be occupied with BRT trunk uh, networks. This is the institutional setup of BRT that we are working together with the other ministries so that uh, to, 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 to effectively implement the BRT uh, operations. Uh, yes, that is here. We work with the bus operators and fare collectors and fund manager as a private sector, but 
uh, that we collaborate with the Tanlos in infrastructure development because Tanlos, they are mandated to construct the highways. So they constructed the BRT lanes for us and Latra is the one responsible issuing license to our bus operators and managing the, uh, the licensing issues. And we have, on top of us, we have the ministry and the, prime, and the president's office, regional administration, local government. That is the institutional setup. So now we have already opened the phase one operation uh, since uh, year 2016, May, officially. And that uh, phase one bus operations in, uh, consists of one depot, which is our operation, but we, we added one new depot. It's not yet to be opened, not yet to be operated, but it's, we have it at Obungo. So we have two depots, uh, as I'm speaking, one at Yangwan and the other one uh, mini depot at uh, Obungo. Total intermediate station 28, and we have five terminals uh, for phase one, and we have uh, filler stations uh, and 11 filler routes connected to main corridor. This is the fleet status up to now. Uh, we have a total of 210 buses in operation. And of those, we have uh, rigid buses, uh, standard feeder and, uh, and uh, hybrid feeder. And we have articulated buses, about 109 buses. Very little slice remaining. Uh, I can say this one is about technology. Or oh, that in BRT we use technology and the institution uh, arrangement that the, the PPP arrangement that the government is uh, uh, putting the infrastructure and the private uh, running the fare collection and there is bus operator who is private uh, buying the buses and put them on the road. This is ITS. I skip this one because this is the one managing the movement of the buses and the fare collection. This is financing arrangement. We have we have been financed to phase one was financed by the World Bank and phase two is financed by the construction with infrastructure financed by the African Development Bank and phase three is the World Bank. So this is the financing up to phase five. Phase five is financed by the French Development Agency, but phase six not yet decided. This is the success stories. About the BRT, we have been awarded uh, an international award from a uh, sustainable transport award. And then we have uh, been awarded by C40 award, uh, our system. And then we have this success of being visited by colleagues from uh, nearby countries to learn about our success. Uh, this is another success. You, have, you will have PowerPoint presentation to, to go through this. I'll talk a little bit about the challenges we encountered uh, since we started. One of the challenges, this is we, it, number one was the BRT system as itself was new. So we have to get used to it, to learn from it. Then there's uh, another challenge of overcrowding in buses because as we, we started with a few buses and now at least we have 10 buses. Uh, and then we, we had an adequate skills uh, on modern technologies about uh, example scheduling of buses and in incomplete fare collection system. That is the challenge, uh, challenges we have. And so this is some of the mitigation we uh, undertake to, to, to minimize the challenges. Once we reach uh, uh, phase uh, 2030, we expect to have all six phases in op operation. And this is the expectation when we reach uh, 2030, we'll have a total of 170 articulated devices on road. And the, the total trip per week will be 2.5 million uh, BRT trips per week. And this is the extension of the buses. We expect to extend uh, the routes uh, to far parts after 2030, we will extend the BRT routes to reach far. This is another uh, improvement on the BRT corridor is about TOD. Uh, now we are developing TOD and we have uh, plans for phase one and phase two, three, four to be implemented. 
This is the phase one plan for transit oriented developments, which is now uh, under implementation. And the challenges we had with GOD is about the resettlement issues and the low cost housing sector. Uh, that is how to mobilize the investment. This is the conclusion slide that uh, phase one interim operations uh, winning the Global Sustainable Transport Award has been a great achievement in Tanzania considering the, uh, the efforts uh, put in this project. So hopefully public transport in Dar es Salaam will be further improved to almost uh, and convenient to the majority of classes. Uh, of public that's reduced considerably, considerably the use of private cars and we go for use of mass transit, which is highly a technology uh, bus system. I beg to submit and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Kuganda, for that presentation. And uh, you might have uh, as well uh, seen in the chat that uh, several questions coming your way, but you, you're going to get an opportunity to respond and react to those questions uh, some few minutes later. And with that, uh, since we are quite behind time, I would like to welcome uh, Prinjal, please, on our presentation on electric rickshaws deployment in India. Welcome, Prinjali. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Can you hear me? Yes. We yes, can we can hear you. And can you see the slideshow in full uh, slide mode? Yes. I think there is some time like just this. Yeah. Now it is. Okay. First of all, thanks for inviting me for this session. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about uh, Amritsar's uh, green and sustainable mobility, where the intention was to replace the uh, auto rickshaws, uh, which are uh, plying there informally, like uh, Boda Buda or Dala Dalas in uh, African cities. We have auto rickshaws in many uh, mid-sized Indian cities. So this initiative is uh, taken up by the AFD, uh, French Development Agency, and under which uh, they are trying to have some reforms uh, to improve the mobility sector in Amritsar. Uh, so quickly, Amritsar is a city uh, that is situated in North India, and it is about 1.5 million population, and we call it like a, a mid-sized city. And there are uh, around 400 cities which are like uh, this, and they are highly dependent on the shared mobility or auto rickshaws. And uh, this particular city, Amritsar, is famous uh, as a tourist city. So this also gives uh, 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 you know, a lot of boost for the rickshaw drivers to fly auto rickshaws from the railway station or the airport to the various uh, tourist spots, especially the locations where the uh, cabs cannot enter, but the auto rickshaws can enter. So there is high potential to use auto rickshaws there. Uh, so quickly, I'll explain the mobility challenges that are faced uh, by the city or that, that the city is facing. So like other many other Indian city or even African cities, there is very high dependency on the private vehicles and it is still increasing. So in Amritsar, they uh, have the BRT system, which is around 31 kilometers long, but still there is high number of uh, auto rickshaws flying in other parts of the city or sometimes also parallel to the uh, BRT. So the biggest challenge and the biggest thing uh, or the biggest mistake the city did is like they didn't have any kind of dialogue or any uh, formalization before they started the BRT. And now there is this com competition between the two services. But under this program, under this project, there, there is uh, an attempt to uh, integrate both the services and also to uh, electrify the auto rickshaws that are flying in the city. And you can see that almost 22% uh, dependence is there on the paratransit, which includes this uh, auto rickshaws. And there are more than 15,000 uh, auto rickshaws in the city and all are old polluting diesel vehicles. They are uh, on the diesel and uh, adding to a lot of air pollution. And based on the surveys, which uh, we did in multiple parts of the city, uh, in most of the parts, uh, the PM 2.5 levels or PM 10 levels are really, really high and exceeding the permissible limit. So you can understand the uh, pollution that is being added by this uh, 
diesel and you can say adulterated diesel or uh, adulterated fuel also and as you can see it is like of uh, many african city you can see the sector is quite informal quite unorganized and uh, because it is informal there is no um a regulation there there is no coordination between various rickshaw drivers they compete with each other there is a lot of unfair competition and overtaking and over speeding to get more and more passengers and uh, if we see what are the challenges faced by the stakeholders we can see there are two major stakeholders one is auto rickshaw drivers those are our stakeholders and also the passengers which are using or which are dependent on this uh, rickshaw system so number one is high amount of informality of the sector and because of that there is a lot of poor treatment by traffic police and all the authorities to rickshaw drivers they are not allowed to stop at multiple lo many locations uh, they are always blamed for causing traffic congestion so people don't see that uh, uh, you know streets are choked up by private vehicles but as soon as they see 10 not rickshaws they blame the rickshaws so there is uh, all this blame game that is happening so overall there is no status or there is no uh, you can say uh, recognition of this industry by the city administration or especially by the citizens and overall because of the informality the discipline there is lack of discipline and uh, within themselves also they are not able to figure out who will stand first in the queue and because everyone wants more and more passengers and it all leads to unfair competition and also challenges the safety of the uh, passengers and if we see what is happening with the uh, because of the old auto rickshaws it is not just the informality of the sector but because of the old uh, vehicles there is high maintenance cost that is attached with the vehicles plus comfort of the driver is also really really poor because it is uh, not maintained uh, the uh, vibrations the noise is really really high uh, also a lot of drivers have taken loans from the informal uh, sectors and uh, it is uh, uh, at very high interest rate so there is a lot of burden on them and again on top of it uh, as uh, in many uh, cities across the world uh, which they have faced is like you know adverse impact of the covid because they were not allowed to fly or maybe they were allowed to fly with 50% occupancy so overall because of this informality and because of this non acknowledgement of the sector the there is a lot of impact on uh, this sector due to covid and number two stakeholders are our passengers and you can see there is a very uh, poor passenger comfort the rickshaws are not maintained also they are uh, there are eight ten passengers in one rickshaw as again the next rickshaw goes uh, uh, vacant just because of there is no coordination there is no service plan there is no service level benchmarks that are attached to it and all this is because of the informality of the sector so the number one reason uh, we we when we started this project uh, with afd uh, it was recognized that uh, only electrification or only replacement of this rickshaws is uh, not going to serve any purpose the number one thing is uh, to do is to formalize this sector acknowledge that they have very important role to play in the mobility they can contribute to the mobility and let them make a part of the uh, system and the decision making process Uh, so for the first thing which we started with is institutional reforms even before starting this uh, re replacement of uh, uh, vehicles so first number one thing is uh, the institutional reforms that uh, we are doing and uh, 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 this is loan come grant come some part is coming from the national government uh based on the, all the calculations uh, uh, out of 15000 in the as But under this project at least 12400 auto rickshaws can be replaced with diesel auto rickshaws and uh, it is not uh, uh, just a burden on the auto rickshaw driver to replace his or her vehicle but there is also the subsidy will be given uh, which is uh, which will vary from 25% to 40% based on which model the driver chooses uh, so he will get handsome amount of uh, subsidy from the government plus uh, kind of a guarantee from the government and facilitation for the loan for the remaining portion of the uh, cost of the new electric auto rickshaw 
and uh, total project cost is around 13 million uh, USD and uh, under which this uh, entire project will be done. So it is not just about uh, the whole cost is not just being used just for the replacement, but I, I'll also show what the other components will be doing. So number one is uh, under the, this technology re reform, so there will be this replacement of around 12,000 uh, auto rickshaws with new uh, electric auto rickshaws. This is just a prototype. I mean, this is just as an example. There are uh, four or five uh, manufacturing uh, uh, companies. Those have been empaneled and uh, the auto rickshaw driver will get uh, a choice which auto rickshaw uh, he wants, which electric auto, I would say, which electric auto uh, he wants. He will have that uh, choice with him. Uh, then along with it, the city will also be installing the charging infrastructure and upgrading it. And there has, uh, are discussions with the electricity department to get some subsidy on the uh, rate of the consumption of the electricity so that this becomes whole affordable business, even in terms of the operations. And of course, the financial subsidy and facilitating loan process is uh, what the government will be doing uh, and uh, handholding support to the rickshaw driver in the entire process will be given by the government, which is Amritsar Smart City Limited. And also the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs is uh, supporting this project nationally so that uh, you know they can also uh, support in terms of the finances, in terms of they can replicate it in other cities. Uh, so under these institutional reforms, as I mentioned, we started with institutional reforms and recently the cooperative society of rickshaw drivers have been formed. Uh, so there were two options given or uh, may not given but discussed. One was the cooperative society and one was the corporatization. Uh, but from the discussions and from the decision makers side, we uh, finally concluded that cooperative society should be the first uh, step because they, there was a lot of resistance for corporatization because uh, there was threat of uh, losing entrepreneurship uh, of the system. And in the cooperative, everyone will uh, retain their entrepreneurship. So we went ahead with the cooperative society formation. So the number one step. Also, this cooperative society chairperson and the president will be the part of the transport committee that is uh, being set up by the city. Uh, so that they can uh, raise their voice there, they can have coordination between the rickshaw driver flying rickshaw on the street and with the decision makers who is sitting and they don't know what is happening with the uh, rickshaw sector as such. So this way we are trying to acknowledge the sector or the importance of the sector. And uh, when they uh, are becoming the part of the system uh, through this cooperative, that is a number one there is a prerequisite to get the loan and the subsidy. So they have to be a part of the, uh, they should be a member of this cooperative system. They will have to sign the service level agreement. Uh, so the drunk and drive is not allowed, passenger limits and the routes allotted, etc., etc. Whatever those are, they will have to uh, sign those service level agreements. So this is in favor of the passengers and to improve the passenger comfort. And the sales monitoring will also be done by the cooperative system. So there were also multiple options to do the monitoring because uh, just to have random checks uh, through maybe traffic police, but we thought that self-monitoring is also required or that will be more effective uh, because uh, in general, we see that traffic police have a lot of issues with the uh, rickshaw sector and they should not be troubling them and or they should not be continuing troubling them so self-monitoring through uh, the marshals or the wardens uh, will be done on uh, some of the routes uh, just to check the service level agreements will be are being followed or not and this cost of the marshal will be borne by the city so the cooperative will not pay uh, at least in the initial years till the cooperative society makes some revenues or makes some money and they have some um, good balance sheet but that by that time, the handholding support for that will also be provided by the city government. And uh, as I mentioned, that the total project cost is not, not just for the replacement, but uh, the skill development of uh, the driver and driver families is also part of this project. And why we thought to include it is like, uh, uh, you know, this sector has been neglected for so many years. And that is the reason uh, sometimes they don't their language might be rough or they might not be knowing how to deal with the passengers so that they get more passengers so this kind of soft skill training uh, plus uh, insurance plus uh, medical facilities will be given uh, under the total project cost 
and uh, skill development uh, courses for drivers families will also be conducted so that the women in the family the children of uh, the drivers family will also get benefited because you observe that uh, due, because of the covid rickshaws were not allowed to ply and that's the reason the their income was totally zero and if there would have been another person earning from other sector there could have been uh, some income at least so in this kind of situation this kind of you know uh, empowering women in their families can be a good thing to start with so this is also covered in the project so this project is not just electrification just to see which is the model uh, best which is the best charging station company etc but it is kind of a holistic program that deals with the overall upgradation of this industry and plus uh, um, uh, improving the mobility by upgrading this industry and improving air quality as well and because of this we have renamed uh, we have named it as rejuvenation of auto rickshaw in amritsar through holistic intervention so that is our goal and uh, the short form is is rahi and in hindi it means passenger so it uh, uh, the brand also suits the uh, purpose of the entire uh, project thank you and uh, open for uh, i'm open for any questions Thank you so much Pranjali for that uh, presentation. I know you had to go really fast and I really appreciate you um speed and trying to cover everything that you had for us. Thank you very much for that. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Edmund and, and Judith for uh very few questions and then we move to the next question because we are running out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you Jacqueline and again very interesting to see the interaction in the chat section. Um I think in the interest of time we will just take one question per speaker and I will start with the question that was directed to Silanda of Ratra. Um and this was asked by Jeremiah Ninda. I know that you have answered this already in the chat but maybe you can um elaborate a little bit more on this question. And the question was what are the conditions classes and procedures for the application for e mobility road service licenses or is it similar to that of existing mode of transport so maybe you could tell us more about the plans um, moving forward regarding e mobility road licenses over to you jofri we 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 have not yet um, started issuing them before we, we we issue them licenses we have to make sure that tbs has allowed them there is a standard specific for, for such and we have to to check with the traffic police if the the the, the vehicle issues are, are covered for, for for such particular vehicles thank you so much jofri over to you edmund for the next question great uh, thanks a lot uh, it's amazing to see how uh, in fact the uh, the interaction is going on in the chat session the next question goes to engineer mohammed and uh, uh, the question goes this way does ongoing brt infrastructure development consider integration of cleaner fuel or electric mobility services for example charging infrastructure in the case of e mobility i can simplify it again engineer mohammed actually in brt infrastructure development and planning uh, there is no consideration of the charging uh, facilities for electric buses uh, actually we move uh, step by step uh, with regard to cleaner fuel and in our planning we we do plan actually we have started procuring the buses which are more cleaner use more cleaner diesel than the previous one so we moved it to euro 4 up to euro 6 and after that we will go for electric buses but the the planning as you understand the planning is and uh, the planning up to 2030 is the brt uh, buses that uses uh, the, the, the diesel but again we have uh, uh, cng uh, we call it tpdc transnational petroleum and development uh, corporation they 
they have introduced the CNG in our country and they showed, showed the interest to team up with the Dutch so that uh, our buses could use CNG. So we hope uh, CNG buses will be coming uh, earlier than the electric buses. So we have started um, uh, arranging the space for the CNG installation of compressors to our depots. And we hope that our next depot will include CNG in there so that uh, when we get a bus operator to operate uh, the buses, uh, there is an option for him to buy a CNG buses. It's much uh, 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 improved in case of emission, right? So we go step by step. We, we in the RT buses, we are not jumping uh, to electric before getting to CNG first. But with regard to Bajaji, electric Bajaji, we have a project here with the coordinator that we are going to uh, construct uh, charging points for electric Bajaji, actually, not for the buses, uh, so that it can, we can have this demonstration electric Bajaji on run. So that is the initiative with regard to planning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for your explanations. We have one question for uh, uh, Pranjali. Uh, Judith, would you be kind to take it? Um, Pranjali, we have a question for you from Penina. And she begins with a comment. She says, we need to see more women in the institutional reforms. From the slides that you presented earlier, majority of the customers are women. Are there any ongoing efforts on this? Sure. Uh, good question. And uh, uh, this is a very, uh, like, you know, common question we come across. Uh, so there are two things that are being planned. Yes, there are a lot of commuters who are women and uh, they are highly dependent on the auto rickshaw. So number one is to provide them comfort uh, by uh, changing occupancy in the city. So, uh, sorry, occupancy in the auto so that they are more comfortable. But that is like, you know, one part of the story. Also, we are trying to get uh, some women, some female uh, auto rickshaw drivers in the sector because today there is there are zero female auto uh, drivers in the system, and to crack that is the biggest challenge, which is uh, which we are now dealing with. And uh, what we are proposing is to allow permit of the existing rickshaw driver. Uh, to his uh, wife or daughter or daughter-in-law or uh, sister so that there will be women who will be part of the system uh, as a driver also. So it should not be just the commuters who are uh, female, but uh, if uh, there are women drivers also, of course we can uh, consider like there might be more safety, there might be, uh, uh, you know, different experience. And for that, um, under the skill development, uh, the, there are uh, discussions going on to provide uh, free training to these uh, female uh, members for driving uh, electric auto rickshaws. And uh, uh, the, the benefit of uh, bringing uh, female drivers into the system is that number one, the overall system gender uh, thing will uh, improve. And also um, electric auto rickshaws are very easy to drive. Even I have tried it and it's really, really easy to drive. So it's not that, you know, very heavy vehicle, which they will have to pull, etc. So uh, overall also, uh, I'm sure their experience as a driver will be great. And uh, if women uh, driver and women passengers can be a great combination in terms of safety and in terms of improving the gender balance. So yes, we are trying. But uh, we are going step by step, um, knowing the city and knowing the resistance from the male drivers. We don't want to uh, bombard them with a lot of ideas. Uh, so this thing will be tried out in uh, slightly next phase. Uh, by that time, we are working uh, to prepare a gender action plan so that we can come uh, with this kind of ideas and embed them uh, in the project. Thank you, Pranjali. And Thanks. of course, that is really good music to my ears, actually. Um, I wish you the best with the gender reforms. Um, so our colleague Jacqueline is having some technical challenges. So I will hand over back to Edmund um, to carry forward the program as we wait for Jacqueline. Over to you, Edmund. Great. Thanks a lot uh, to all our speakers. It's really, really been insightful knowing what the the city authorities are doing, what the plans are, and then uh, already seen on the ground what is happening. 
uh, with that, the DRT and, and, and upcoming uh, uh, solutions, and then learning also from India. Indeed, uh, this really has been good. So we will take our next two presentations. Uh, uh, the first one is coming from Katie uh, from Rupert uh, Concepts, who will then uh, take us through uh, policy planning and integration of e-mobility into sustainable urban mobility planning. So indeed, this will enlighten us more, uh, uh, telling us more about how all our initiatives we already are doing could be integrated and also how we can bring in the, um, at the element of electric mobility. So Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Edmund. And thank you everyone um, for the opportunity to be here and to share with you some some ideas about um, e-mobility and integrated planning. So actually now my presentation will, uh, will be slightly different to the ones that we were hearing. So we want to give you some uh, introduction on how to combine, how to integrate these two, maybe the, the initiatives that uh, the authorities are thinking to implement in Dar es Salaam on e-mobility, uh, how they can um, integrate with the planning processes that are going on in the city. So what we are going to look in more detail is, uh, of course, this integration between the planning processes with e-mobility initiatives. Also, how we can address electrification in the context of SUMP. And um, uh, yeah, just have uh, maybe a short example. Um, so, um, so what are we going to, how are, how are, we, going, are we going to bring together e-mobility with integrated planning? So maybe some of you have heard about uh, SUMP. So SUMP stands for Sustainable Urban Mobility Planning, right? So it's kind of um, this strategic plan that cities are developing to uh, uh, set out a vision, of, of course, analyze the, the mobility situation in the city, set out, set out the vision targets, and then the measures of the of this plan, and then uh, approve, right? To be approved, and then they start, start the implementation, right? So um, uh, this methodology, there is a methodology to develop an, an SUMP, which you can see very um, in this in the in the graph in the in the graph that you can see in this in the slide. Um, so the methodology to to develop an SUMP consists, as you can see, in four phases, which are the colors here and 12 steps, which is actually this, uh, this methodology we have developed uh, and we work on this topic already for more than 20 years. So, and this was used in many countries around the world. Um, so uh, this is of course an idealistic and simplified uh, um, representation of how the process really look like in practice, because we know, right, the ones who are planning the city, developing different plans and projects. We know that things in practice really work in a very organic way, right? And it really depends on the context. So um, this uh, process aims to simplify and represent this process. Um, but in practice, the steps can take uh, over in different order maybe, right? And some steps maybe we have to, we will have to skip depending on what we have in the context and what is the situation as well. Uh, so in this specific case, for example, in regards to immobility, we, we, will, we will see a bit more in detail what we could do in each of these phases so that we can integrate the immobility initiatives, right? Or even the preparation and see also what is the situation on that aspect so that we can implement uh, more effectively the immobility solutions. So for example, in the phase one of the SUMP process, um, in the phase one, we focus mostly from the decision to develop an, a plan, a mobility plan to investigate what are the resources that we have, um, both um, uh, human resources and financial resources. And also we, we investigate about our planning context, what are the, the legal and nor, uh, um, legal aspects and norms that we have in our cities, other plans, maybe national plans, regional plans, you know, all these planning contexts. And then also we uh, start 
the analysis of the of the mobility situation. Um, so in this part, we we do all this groundwork, right, about the planning processes and structures and everything. So we should, for example, in regards, uh, we should. Uh, really do would be to identify the entities, so all the different entities, public and private, and also to, to see who can provide the, the needed capacities, skills, experience, and resources that we require for uh, not only developing the plan, but also implementing the solutions. Um, so, you know, also the, we need to clearly define this planning framework so that we can um, um, uh, we can realize if we need, for example, new norms or new uh, legal frameworks, right? That will enable us to implement e-mobility solutions, for example. Sometimes when we need to implement these innovative solutions and e-mobility, of course, is an innovative one. In many cities, we don't have in place yet the norms the incentives maybe, the regulations required. So these have to be set first before you can actually can start doing something, right? So once we start investigating that, then we realize, okay, we need this policy, we need this strategy, this regulation, and we can start uh, adjusting and creating this enabling environment for our e-mobility solutions. Um, also, so we need to check um, all the issues related to electrification. For example, the, the immobility solutions or the electrification of transport, what other issues it will help us solve. For example, reduce the greenhouse emissions, right? Or also noise uh, in the city, uh, also maybe changing the energy supply, like all the, all the things that it will require also the conditions that are needed in the place so that implementation can happen. And these conditions in regards to infrastructure, in regards to type of services, regulations, and more other aspects. Um, so um, we know that when we develop uh, electromobility uh, projects, uh, we, we mean to bring these two sectors together. So energy and mobility, right? In practice, both of them many times are working on, on their own, but uh, to effectively implement uh, electromobility, we need to bring them together. Um, so that means uh, that we need to identify all the relevant stakeholders in these sectors, understand what are their roles, what are their interests, and also to, um, to build also uh, new cooperation models between these uh, two sectors. And not, not only in the government, but also outside, right? So in the, within the government, in the different departments, but also outside with the private sector, with the, maybe uh, the academia, NGOs, you know, all these different stakeholders that will help us uh, in the implementation of these solutions. Um, so this will help in the internal coordination um, and also on the external cooperation with all these different um, stakeholders. Another key part is to um, plan on the basis of user needs. So you can see here uh, the, some of the um, uh, needs, for example, uh, features of specific user groups that we need, to, we need to really know in deep so that we can understand what the user requires, right? So what is their needs? So, and that we can uh, respond to those needs. And so in order to, for example, upscale e-mobility, like jump from, uh, we will start potentially, for example, in Dar es Salaam with some pilot projects, right? when the, maybe it's decided, oh, we want to launch this specific pilot, maybe it could be for rickshaws as it was showing Pranjali, or could be another solution, right? You jump, you start with pilot projects, but then you want to, uh, you want to grow. You want, to, you want a, a higher uptake of immobility solutions. Uh, we need to really 
start addressing the user needs. And we need to move from the technology and cost drive approach to understanding and addressing these requirements, preferences, and concerns of potential uh, new users. So here, for example, it's very important to use other, um, for example, um, uh, pro um, projects or in, in initiatives in, relate, in relation to urban design, for example, spatial planning and user behavior so that we can complement our projects and our initiatives to make them more um, maybe integrated, right? In the, and also to respond better to the user needs. And also um, along the process that we are developing a plan, that we are also in, that we are also developing maybe our um, plan to implement an electromobility solution, it is very important that we uh, really um, develop a plan for citizen engagement and also to for not only citizens but also of all stakeholders, right? So um, in this part, this will help us also understand what are the user needs. So here, for example, uh, you can see in this chart, all the different um, activities, uh, participatory activities you can, you can do with the different groups, uh, also uh, varying from the level of engagement you want to, you want to um, uh, give them, you want to you know, engage with them. So there are different levels, so for example, here we can see inform is the, is the lowest level of engagement where we just inform. And then we can also consult, for example, the citizens. And then if we go one step further, we can collaborate with citizens. So, you know, work together, sit in the same table. And then the, the highest level of engagement is the empowerment where we really give them the, the, maybe the, um, they can decide right over some specific uh, solutions right so we can really see where we want to uh, give them which level of engagement and here are some recommendations of um, activities you can uh, organize in the different phases of the SUMP planning um, so um, you can see this more in detail in our SUMP guide that we have which is very uh, much more you will see a lot more details on this on this topic plus many other topics uh, around SUMP, but this is just for you to give you an idea of the different activities you can engage with, with the citizens. And another also uh, important step here is the analysis of the planning and regulatory framework. As we said, right, for these innovative solutions and uh, new technologies, this is very, very important. Maybe the ones who were I mean, just with the implementation with, for example, the BRT system in Dar es Salaam, you have realized this was a new system in the city, right? So you have realized how is to uh, implement an innovative solution, which requires so many changes, even maybe the creation of new institutions and new frameworks and everything. So this is an ongoing process with many new solutions that we, you would like to in, implement in your cities. And this will require the identification of all, all these different conditions um, in the context, also maybe potential barriers, and then to find ways how we can mitigate those barriers or how we, or how we can fill those gaps um, uh, so that we can uh, implement the more effectively the solutions. So in this sense, for example, SUMP uh, will help us or we, we have this uh, integrate, integration, um, integrating role in this, in this aspect. Because SUMP will try to integrate all these different, for example, sectoral plans that uh, are, are being developed for specific uh, maybe solutions, maybe for there are like maybe there is a uh, urban plan being developed. There is here the plan for the BRT. There is another plan here, right? But SUMP can be this integrator and that will align all these visions and all these uh, key objectives for the long-term change. So this would be important to consider. And in the phase two uh, of the SUMP uh, development process, 
we will look at the um, the strategic direction of our plan. So we will see the scenarios for our city, for the future, also the vision, the objectives, and also we will set targets and indicators. You know? So, and also we will see, we will define objectives on how to materialize those um, targets in a measurable way. So in this part, what is important for immobility, for example, is to develop, to, to integrate immobility in all the different scenarios so that we can really see what is the impact that they can have, right? So immobility will not only, maybe it's not only a technological change, but it will change also uh, in many other aspects in the city. And it will have uh, a lot more other impacts as well. So it would be good if we could measure all of that so that we can really see, you know, like uh, what is the value of it in the context, maybe in, this, in the situation of the city. So in this part, uh, immobility for a, for a successful implementation, we have to have, we, we need to have a, a holistic approach in our city. And in this part, uh, what, what, um, what we should always consider is that immobility, you know, is, is very integral if we want to achieve um, a multimodal and sustainable system, right? Because uh, of course, if we can change, you know, the energy supply or the energy sources of, uh, of our transport system, we will make a huge uh, contribution, right? To re the reduction of emissions. And not only that, quality of life in our cities and also we can improve, you know, the urban fabric, maybe the, the, the arterial uh, roads in the city, etc. So here, considering that the public transport is the backbone of the mobility, right? And we can consider other solutions such as micromobility or maybe shared services for the first and last mile deliveries. So we still have this in our minds when we plan the solutions for the city and how mobility can help us reach those uh, goals. And in this part, for example, um, going a bit a bit on the detail on what do we need, for example, for charging infrastructure when we uh, when we start developing immobility solution, um, we need to see that uh, the charging infrastructure, for example, um, this is very important. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. Sorry. Could 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 we uh, wind up the discussion in two three minutes, please? I will You're try really to go. running short of time. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Right. Okay, so um, we will try to do it uh, and very quickly. You can see the details on the slides that will be shared. Um, so, um, I mean, just important aspects here, for example, to check is that the charging infrastructure is uh, uh, enough for the citizens. Right, and also in interoperability issues, and that we can also um, attract new users for to to the to to electric vehicles, to the use of electric vehicles. There are some some aspects also to consider on the ownership and responsibility of the immobility e of, of the electric charging, for example. So here you can see the differences between public companies and private companies. You can see that maybe a bit more in detail. And then also on the phase three, what we can see here is about the measure planning. And here we will see more in detail. So what are the measures we are going to implement for our city? And uh, also the finance, the, the finance that we need for implementation and all of it. So of course it's important that, that we integrate immobility here. But in he here, what we recommend is that Im the mobility strategy could be considered as a, as a separate document to the SUMP, but as an annex, and it's still aligned with the main objectives of the plan. And here also, there are some recommendations on that part, uh, which lies mostly on the cooperation framework that we really need a strong cooperation framework between all the different uh, key stakeholders. The data management is an, is an important issue, who owns the data and how the data is shared. And the uh, public authority needs to make sure that still can, you know, the, they can still access the data, which is very important. 
and the inter interoperability again. So there are some also important aspects on the funding, very important to see where we can get the funding from for these immobility e solutions. So it could be maybe international corporations, banks, and maybe national funding. So seeing the options that, that could be, um, could help there. And also, and on the last phase, uh, we see the implementation and monitoring. So here, you know, how we are implementing the measures and what we can learn in the process. So here is um, just some recommendations of uh, how we can keep learning and we can keep, keep expanding the network for um, a, uh, a wider transformation of the e-mobility into electric. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's very important just to keep learning in the process. And uh, yeah, we are happy also to, to, yeah, maybe to provide more information if you need. And uh, I will also share in the, in the comments our topic guide on electrification and SUMP in the framework of SUMP, uh, where you can see a lot more details on this topic. And yeah, we're happy also to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katie, for that presentation. And um, I would now like to welcome Penina, our colleague from ITDP, who is going to take us through the Kisumu case study. Penina, over to you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, let me share my screen. So I'm Penny Nandagwa, I'm a transport planning associate at ITDP. And uh, we, I'm happy to just briefly take you through the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan um, that we've prepared, launched, and it's one of my favorite projects because it's one project that we've seen go full circle, like from planning to, uh, you know, adopting yeah. to actually implementing the project. So Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan is actually first of a kind uh, mobility plan for Kisumu City. It's under the umbrella of ISUT, which is a you know integrated strategic development plan. And its goal is basically to provide efficient, affordable, equitable, and safe uh, mobility for all. So basically, uh, the mobility plan was centered around ensuring that everyone is catered for uh, in the and included uh, in the mobility sector. So the planning process entails a collection of baseline surveys. So maybe this is similar to what Katie presented. So we collected a lot of baseline uh, data and then uh, just to understand the mobility challenges for the, the different stakeholders. And we did this through uh, um, household surveys, traffic counts, uh, key format interviews with all the decision makers that uh, matter to operators and all that. Then once we did that, we understood the challenges in the ground, then we developed a common vision, which is just what I presented. And then after that, now we're able to select priorities that would help us get to a sustainable uh, mobility scenario. And then of course, um, we came up with an implementation framework to guide the implementation for the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan. So, but one thing I have to say is that um, the city was very much involved, starting from the governor to the city managers, the former and the current, and that's why the process was so successful. Once the plan was completed, uh, we, have, we had to give time for public comment, and we do that by publishing a gazette notice. So with the assistance of, assistance of the city, they published the, the gazette notice, and this paved way for you know, people to give comments. And all the comments were reviewed, integrated, and added to the report. Now, once we had addressed all the comments, we then now launched the report. Uh, it was actually a public event. That's one thing I like about this project. It was not like launched in a hotel or a boardroom. It was actually in a public arena uh, on the streets of Kisumu, meaning that everybody was actually, you know, it was an open and transparent process. So we launched it earlier this year in February. And I'm happy to say that actually the implementation has started and I'll be sharing a few of that. So just going briefly into the data that was collected. So majority of the residents in Kisumu work and 13% uh, actually use public transport. So for us, it was very important to ensure that the mode share for sustainable modes of transport is maintained. But just trying to analyze how the situation was, still is in some parts, but at least right now they're already improving. So we noted that um, there was less provision for the pedestrians. As you can see, a lot of people are walking on the streets, on the sidewalk, on, 
well and on the unpaved such, uh, parts of the road we have caregivers uh risking their lives you know children trying to cross and people just you know hustling their way we had we had some section with open drains that of course are very risky for people to cross we had uh, we still have some parts with very wide intersections that you know the dangers of crossing uh, of course, some community have tried to come up with uh, short-term strategies to, you know, enable the people to be able to cross, you know, like these are DIY, uh, so to speak, um, bump, just to slow down traffic, meaning that that street is not very safe for children to cross when they're going to school. So we have, we still have very wide uh, streets. Um, this is uh, one of the highways, Nairobi Road, and as you can see, it's very wide and children have to risk their lives every day crossing the street. Again, the cyclists are not well catered for. Um, and uh, we can see, of course, it's the traffic and you know the risk of it, you know, accidents and all that. Now, going down to the scenarios, the mobility scenarios. So under the status quo, we have a lot of motorized traffic. Like priority has been given to the car, despite it being one of the least used mode in the city. So if we continue like that, we are likely to actually double the private car use. And then you can start thinking about the, uh, the implication of that in terms of congestion, the traffic emissions, the accidents that would uh, be in the city. So we wanted to change that. And that's why we came up with now a more sustainable scenario. And by doing that is ensuring that we have more, uh, we, we, we are more inclined to sustainable modes that is walking, cycling and use of public transport. And so by doing that, we set up the goals and we want to ensure that at least in the next 10 years, 55 trips of all trips within the city are going to be made by walking and cycling. And then of course, over 80% of motorized trips should go to public transportation. Then you also have to reduce the private car use uh, through travel demand management that I'll briefly talk about. And of course, moved um, shift to more uh, lower polluting vehicles uh, in the city. And I'll talk something about that. So how do we get there? First of all, you have to, ex to provide excellent pedestrian environment because if you have to make sure that the motor is increased, then we have to provide the facilities for the pedestrian to make it more friendly and safe for them. So we have to expand the pedestrian network. We have to ensure that Cycling network is connected and complete. Uh, and of course, even coming up with a uh, cycle parking. But even if you're a cyclist, you have on street cycle parking within the city. Then uh, another aspect is, of course, modernizing the public transport system. And um, I'll I'm trying to rush. So for the NMT, we came up with a, this proposal of 100 kilometers of, um, of Side of, uh, of um, pedestrian footpaths and that one kilometers of cycle uh, network. And I'm happy to report that actually some of these projects are already uh, ongoing. So this is actually not a render. Someone sometimes back asked me whether this was a render. This is a real street uh, in Kisumu City, it's one of the uh, streets that they have implemented. And they're actually expanding to make sure that the, the whole of Kisumu is going to be like this in the next 10 years. So excited to see how that turns out. And one thing I have to say is that they really maintain their tree cover and they are expanding their pedestrian and infrastructure network. I have not seen Kisumu really cut down the trees like what we've seen in Nairobi. So that's uh, a plus. Then they've also provided um, tabletop crossings. Of course, they are elevated bumps and they are safer for pedestrian to cross and even persons using wheelchairs are able to navigate through. So this again, the cycle network is at five kilometers that we hope to see implemented in the, in the coming years. So this is again, Alexand, uh, right now if you go to Kisumu, it's not like you're not in touch with the, with the, with the lake. And being a lake city, it's very important to ensure that the two are connected. So there's this proposal to just have uh, the, the lake belt opened up for people to enjoy and to walk through it and just, you know, open up the economic activity. Uh, because right now, Kisumu, you know, the lake is behind the city, but now we want to make it more of a waterfront uh, development. Then we also came up with a bike share system and um, we proposed that at least in the first phase, we should be having like 400 cycles, still planning underway. So for the BRT and uh, for the public transport, I don't want to talk too much about this because I know Uganda mentioned something similar uh, in the Salam about how you set up a public transport system. But one thing I have to say is that already we are already working with the city to come up with a service plan uh, that is going to guide the city 
uh, in uh, coming up with a modern public transport system that is cleaner, that is greener, high capacity buses with low, a minimum standard of uh, four, uh, Euro four standards for the emissions. And also we propose that because it's actually our immobility webinar, we propose that uh, we need to do conduct a feasibility study or to see you know, the viability of electrification of public transport fleet. And I'm happy to see that's already a guideline on how to do that, uh, whatever Katie presented. So that should be coming up soon. Um, then on the, so this is how we did uh, a render just to show how it's going to be transformed. The city, the current scenario and the projected scenario, of course, now with cleaner, greener buses, and of course, including the, the NMT uh, integration into the public transport system. Then one thing that is so important, we have to do a lot of communication and outreach. So we are already working in the city to plan more cafe events, uh, just to try and so to speak for, on the need for sustainable mobility and what it means for them as a city and as far as climate change is concerned. Because actually Kisumu city is one of the victims or it's already experiencing the, the impact of climate change, having the lake actually rise. Of course, we know uh, they want, you know, it, it has already, you know, uh, it has risen and encroached into lands, you know, settlements, and a lot of people are already moving away from the lake. And so, at least just them understanding from their own perspective that mobility could contribute to reducing the greenhouse gases is important because they want to make their, you know, city more sustainable and better. Then, um, you know, we also doing a lot of training, building capacity with the city to show that at least they understand how to design the cities better. And actually, it's very successful. So just also adding to what Mr. Kuganda had mentioned, uh, Engineer Kuganda, it's very important uh, when you're making sustainable mobility plan to think about land use planning, because the two cannot uh, be separated. So it's very important to harmonize or to integrate transport planning and land use planning to ensure that at least more, you know, the way you design uh, to ensure that we have mixed use development, uh, we have streets that are connected that it's easier for you to walk or cycle in the city than it is for you to use a car you know ensuring that making such intention decisions when you're designing your city making so sure that you have dense development reduced uh parking spaces you know that just make it easier for you to to walk cycle and even access services and facilities that you need uh, within a walking distance so when you do that's something that we did and we're already working with the city to uh, harmonize some of the ongoing uh, physical development plans to show that uh, they're integrated uh, with the mobility plan. So just going now towards uh, management of private car use, we have to manage parking. And as we speak, as you know, parking is a vicious cycle. It works on the principles of reduced demand. The more you provide, the higher the demand. So really you cannot satisfy this. So we are currently working with the city to come up with a parking management strategy. And that's going to ensure that we are able to manage our private car use. We are able to ensure that more people can actually now move to sustainable mode uh, uh, transport. And even now converting some of those parking spaces to NMT or public spaces within the city. And just thinking about the opportunity cost, what it means, you know, actually like we're doing, when we're doing the parking service, you noted that we have a lot of, uh, we have some buildings with really high, uh, number of, of parking that are less utilized. So in terms of capacity, uh, they are, it's lower than what it was you know, anticipated when they were constructing. And you know, just thinking about what can more can you do with that space? It can be able to provide affordable housing. You know, so that now you're able to bring more people uh, within the urban areas. And also even making sure that you have more uh, spaces, maybe commercial spaces, office spaces, so that now people do not have to move away from the city looking for the similar services that can be provided uh, within the city. Again, covering urban sprawl. So basically that's my presentation. So we need to basically stop uh, catering so much for the cars and also start moving, uh, going to, you know, we need to add transit, add density, cut uh, parking, and we are going to achieve a sustainable city. So that's basically a brief background about what sustainable mobility plan is. And I would urge all the cities to, you know, come up with their own mobility plan. 
uh, like I mentioned, this is a project that's already full circle. We finished the mobility plan, and now we're already having sort of sectoral projects coming just from the mobility plan. We have the parking management strategy. We, on NMT, of course, has been going on uh, even before we completed the plan, and that's what we are seeing. I think right now there should be almost in the 10 kilometer of NMT. Uh, and then we we already now working on a public transport service plan. So you see just having uh, a mobility plan guides, first of all, the city is able to get investments in terms of uh, um, in the mobility sector. And then it also, it also gives a clear direction on how all the transport plans are going to be integrated and uh, give, achieve, you know, they're more harmonized and they're more uh, oriented towards that specific goal. So it's important to start with the mobility plan for any city. And then all these other projects are going to be provided. So feel free to reach out if you need more information on Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan. Of course, you can get it from my website and I'm happy to share more information on this. So thank you so much. I hope I did not take too much time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penina. And no, you didn't. You actually did a very good job at it. Uh, and so I would like to really thank you, the participants. Thank you for, you, for your active interaction. We understand there's been lots of other questions that have, been, have not been answered. But uh, please, if you have a burning one, you can send an email. And we are going to take some of these questions into our discussion tomorrow. And with that, I would like to welcome a very brief word from that, Andrew Presh. So maybe I start with that. Something very brief, please. Yeah, Kalugendo, please welcome for a few words. Yes, welcome, Fano. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Jack and uh, other participants of the meeting uh, for organizing such a uh, a good session. Uh, so far, we have been enlightened with a lot of good information. I do believe the focus of today was on policy planning issues for an integration of e-mobility in sustainable urban mobility plans. Uh, as we shared our experience on transformation of the public transport in the Islam through the BRT, but also the wider range of thinking, how do we have an intermodal thinking around the, 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 the urban, uh, sustainable urban mobility. Uh, from that side, uh, so far we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we know we are partnering, we are implementing the solution plus on uh, IBA judge, but we have not yet uh, moved forward in the speed which was uh, anticipated during the design of the project. But we are still committed to the delivering of the, 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 the project uh, as it was planned. So we assure you our cooperation. Uh, I know the team, we have a team of uh, experts who have been involving, uh, participating in some of the, 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 the sessions. So by having such training, I think it's going to enlighten the, the understanding on the, the, the immobility issues, given the tomorrow uh, topic on the business model and the safety on the relation to the electric vehicle and the charging, I think we'll be more uh, aware of what we need to do and how best do we do that to deliver the Iba Jaji uh, uh, pilot project? With those few remarks, I thank you guys all for your listening, for your active participation, and I you are to continue on the session tomorrow. Asante sana, back to you. Thank you so much, Engineer Kalugendo. I would like to welcome Ropesh for a few words, and then I finalize the program today. Thank you, Jacqueline, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it was really a good discussion with uh, many interesting insights. And uh, well, I think um, the, the important thing would be from us to congratulate actually Tanzania or Dar es Salaam to, to, um, for the initiatives, right? So this idea, this aim to want to, uh, to integrate in mobility solutions in Dar es Salaam. I think um, yeah, you really did a good job with implementing the BRT. We know that uh, there are so many mobility needs in our cities growing, right? And I think this is a really good solution that is actually um, responding to some of the of these needs in the city. 
And uh, yeah, hopefully I think uh, um, you can start maybe implementing a few uh, mobility solutions. Um, and we are of course happy to support in everything we can on this aspect. I think you can just maybe let us know. Um, and then uh, I think there are also good examples that were shared in this uh, session, which I, which I hope have inspired you of what, what you could do on this aspect. Uh, how can you progress further on that? Um, so yeah, I think that would be what I can what I can say, and also share our guide on immobility and SUP, so you can have a look there as well. So we are happy also to um, to to be present here today, and thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Katie, for conclusive remarks, and I would like to take this opportunity again to thank you everyone so much for attending today. And I would like to welcome you tomorrow, same time, uh, 10 hours East African time. And, and the discussion for tomorrow is going to be on business models and safety standards. And again, thank you so much for an active discussion. There's lots of learning that has been going on and we're looking forward for another very interactive event. Um, uh, insightful session tomorrow. Uh, thank you a lot. Sorry for taking 10 minutes of your time. <laughs> See you tomorrow.